Welcome to The World Today. I'm Amarachi Ubani. And I'm Millicent Walker. First, the headlines. Russia says it is closely following NATO movements on its borders as governor of Kharkiv region says attacks are intensifying, particularly in residential areas. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson signs security pact with Sweden, pledges UK support should its military come under attack. And Israel's Bennett says Palestinians rejected offer for joint investigation into journalist killing. Welcome again. We begin with the U.S. Ambassador to Russia, John Sullivan, who has arrived at the Foreign Ministry today, along with Polish Ambassador Kerstof Kraszewski. According to reports, a Polish ambassador has been summoned to the Foreign Ministry after protesters poured red liquid over Russia's envoy to Poland at a wreath laying ceremony in Warsaw on Monday. We'll have more on this as soon as we get the details. In the meantime, Russia's foreign minister says the country has enough buyers for its oil and gas outside of Western countries as EU countries try to reduce their reliance on Russian energy. Sergei Lavrov said, let the West pay more than it used to pay to the Russian Federation and let it explain to its population why they should become poorer. Mr. Lavrov was speaking at a news conference after talks with his counterpart in Muscat, Oman. This is as the governor of Kharkiv region said attacks are intensifying, particularly in residential areas, and the United Nations has reported that the civilian death toll in Ukraine is thousands higher than the official UN figure of 3,381. Well, the Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskyov says that Russia remains committed to its gas supply deals after he was asked to comment on the dispute with Ukraine over the major gas transit to Europe. During a daily conference, Mr. Peskyov told reporters Russia has always met and intends to meet all its contractual obligations. He said, well, we earlier reported the Ukraine's gas pipeline operator had invoked a clause when a business is hit by something beyond its control. It said it was impossible to further transport gas through the crossing point and the border compressor station in Novopskyov, which are located in the occupied territories. Russian gas flows to Europe via Ukraine fell by a quarter on Wednesday after Kyiv halted the use of a major transit routes blaming interference in Russian forces. The first time exports via Ukraine have been disrupted since Russia's military operation in the country began in February. Our viewer is Anna Chernikova joins us now from Kyiv in Ukraine. Anna, thanks for joining us. We understand that Ukraine says it will redirect the flow of natural gas to avoid uh, the key eastern transit point from Russia to Europe. Uh, explain that situation and the impact on Ukraine and countries meant to be receiving gas. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, well, the situation is quite uh, complicated, to be honest, because uh, basically 8% um, of Russian gas uh, transferred to Europe uh, is exactly this uh, transit point, which is uh, Sohranivka. It locates in Luhansk region, and for the moment, uh, it is under Russian occupation. Uh, so this is the first time since the war began that um, there is a problem with gas supply. Uh, I mean, the gas transit through Ukraine uh, because it did continue without any uh, problems and without any interruptions since uh, February 24, the 24th. Um, so what Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian side is claiming that they cannot ensure uh safety and they cannot ensure the operation of this um, um uh, of this point transit point because it's not under ukrainian control so they suggested that the transit is uh, moved uh, to suja it's another transit point which is which was already previously used uh in when uh, russian side needed to do certain technical um, technical works on uh, on the Sokhranivka uh, transit point. So basically, 
this one could be easily used uh, to continue the transit to Europe. However, Gazprom, uh, which is the the, mon the monopoly for Russian uh, expert, uh, gas experts uh, refused to move uh, the transit to this other uh, point, uh, claiming that they don't uh, have any technical possibility, which is, well, not kind of true. So basically um, what we can see for the moment that Ukraine, uh, if Ukraine stops the transit and what we know so far that uh, on Tuesday the transit was 92.8 million cubic meters, while on Wednesday uh, it's 72 million. So it's dropping quite rapidly. And um, in order to fulfill all the obligations, the only way is to move uh, the transit to another point. So basically, um, the countries which are going to suffer, it's Austria, Italy, Slovakia and other East European countries because this is exactly where the gas is going. Uh, for Ukraine, um, well, Ukraine was uh, previously saying that uh, European countries have to think over an alternative to Russian gas in particular because, well, the problem would appear and the problem would be a long term. So. This is the situation for now, and we'll see how it's going to end. Uh, but uh, again, this is just uh, a certain a confirmation of uh, what Mr. Uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, uh, said previously, that Europe should uh, think very uh, specifically um, over the further Russian gas trans transit. Indeed, the, the sixth package, and this is regardless of what Kremlin is saying uh, today, that Russia remains committed to uh, the gas supply deals. But let's go over to what's happening in the Kharkiv region. Uh, the governor there said that attacks are intensifying, particularly in residential areas uh, with the Russia-controlled eastern town of Izium. Uh, what more do we know? Uh, Kharkiv region for the moment remains a uh, very um, crucial point and very important area. What we know that Ukrainian forces had quite a lot of success in this region and they moved successfully forward. Uh, they uh, removed Ukrainian forces uh, almost to the Russian border and um, recaptured uh, a lot of territories and a lot of uh, villages and uh, a lot of areas in that region. However, Izum, which is uh, quite a big city in Kharkiv region, uh, remains under Russian control. And the most heavy fighting are happening there at this point of time. Uh, what we know from today's uh, briefing that uh, starting from today's morning and uh, up to the afternoon, uh, very intense fightings were happening and Ukrainian forces made certain success. Uh, in that region, so um, uh, to the direction of Izum, uh, Ukrainians also destroyed a lot of Russian equipment, including one helicopter and quite a lot of heavy um, weapons. So uh, what we also know regarding Kharkiv attack, that this is true, Russian forces are trying to scare uh, civilians and trying to attack civilian areas. Uh, probably this is certain, you know, there's certain response to Ukrainian successful movements, movements in this area. Um, Anna, the Russian forces have also been shelling the border regions of Sumy and Chennai and of course have continued their attacks on the Azovstal steel plant and those soldiers who are in there uh, with the Ukrainian resistance uh, forces are still holding up. How much longer can they wait and what is, what is the plan here by the government to help the soldiers who are still stuck in the Azovstal steel plant? Uh, so uh, let's start with Sumy and Chernihiv. Uh, these are areas in the north uh, part of the country which were under occupation and were main points um, in Russian uh, way, in Russian route towards Kiev. Uh, so these areas are now free, but again, um, we experience uh, intensifying of missile attacks. And uh, again, uh, this could be kind of a ter terroristic actions by Russian forces because a lot of civilians started to come back to these regions uh, because previously it was not possible due to mining. Uh, and now uh, government is, uh, well, allowing people to come back. So this is probably, you know, certain um, just 
certain scaring uh, of the civilians. But uh, again, unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of damages, new damages in this region. Uh, for the moment, there are no reports of any casualties uh, within the civil society. Uh, moving to Mariupol, uh, Azov style, um, well, probably the only word that I can use to describe what's happening there is hell. And this is exactly what Azov style soldiers are saying that, uh, well, situation is terrible, very difficult. Uh, just a couple of minutes ago, uh, we received information on another massive attack, uh, bombarding and uh, missile attack on Azov style plant. Um, the attack is happening from the land, from the sea and from the air, everything at the same time. Um, soldiers remain uh, there. Uh, they report that there are still uh, more than 100 of civilians in that, uh, together with them in the shelter. So there are now, no, the, the plant is not free of civilians completely. Uh, however, today in the morning, a uh, so-called leader of Donetsk People's Republic said that taking into consideration that there are no civilians there anymore, we can do whatever we want now. And after that uh, war, the uh, Russian forces started uh, another severe attack. Uh, soldiers are, keeping uh, the well, uh, protect, keep the protection um, s service and they continue to uh, do their job. Uh, what they say that there are two possibilities of how this could, uh, how this could be uh, resolved. So, and they said that they do see the military possibility to, um, to retake Azov style and um, so Ukrainian soldiers can try to do. Uh, we don't know, of course, the details, and we don't know if Ukrainian government would take this decision. Another way to rescue soldiers and to uh, resolve this is to uh, proceed with extraction procedure, which could be done by the third country. And uh, this is another point that Ukrainian government is also considering and uh, is negotiating with uh, its European and uh, international partners. Uh, so for the moment, we don't know how exactly uh, this situation could be resolved. But of course, for Ukrainian government, this is the main priority to rescue so soldiers and to rescue civilians that remain in the Azovstal plant. And I would like to remind you that uh, in Mariupol itself, in the city, there are still more than 120,000 civilians, and they also need to be uh, evacuated and rescued. Indeed, indeed, Anna. And uh, the situation in Kherson, uh, Russian forces reportedly have taken over the city and are putting you know, their own people in many of the empty homes. Um, uh, we also understand authorities will be asking uh, the president, that's a Russian president, to uh, make the region a part of Russia. Is that true? This is what we heard from, uh, again, so-called uh, military um, management, as they, they call themselves, uh, of, of, of Kherson. Uh, they announced today that they, they are not going to create uh, a so-called Kherson People's Republic. Uh, this is what they claimed before that they would like to do something similar to what has been done in Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, so yeah, today they announced that they would ask Russian government to include Kherson to, Russian to, to the Russian territory. Uh, Ukrainian officials, uh, official reply uh, was that, of course, they can claim whatever they want and they can uh, join whatever uh, country or planet they want, but uh, this is definitely not going to be uh, recognized, and it's not going to be, uh, you know, um, this, this is not going to be the case for them because Ukrainian forces would take Kherson over. This is ex exactly what officials, uh, Ukrainian officials said. So uh, what we know that Russian uh, government, uh, and in particular Mr. Peskov, the spokesperson uh, of the president of Russia, said that. Uh, if Kherson wants to do this, uh, they would have to go through the procedure that Crimea did. So basically, uh, what we can see from all this and uh, all these uh, things that we've had, that probably they would try to uh, repeat Crimea scenario in Kherson. But again, uh, Ukrainian uh, side is pretty sure that they're not going to be successful in that because uh, Kherson would be uh, recaptured back. 
Anna Chenikova, thanks for your reporting and do continue to stay safe. Thank you. We can bring you more on the situation in Ukraine as it enters the third month of fighting there by Russian forces against the resistance of the Ukrainian forces. Some 14,000 Ukrainians are thought to be currently in Georgia, with many of them from southeast Ukraine and the city of Mariupol. A once bustling industrial port with a pre-war population of 400,000, Mariupol has experienced heavy bombardment since the early days of the conflict, with civilians suffering shortages of drinking water and food. The Kremlin and Russia's Emergency Situations Ministry has said it's offering humanitarian aid to those wanting to leave Mariupol. Russian authorities offered them emergency accommodation, food, temporary immigration documents, a 10,000 ruble grant, and onward travel to a new home in Russia, further away from the border, according to Russian officials and accounts from refugees. Meanwhile, at the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol, and after evacuation of civilians, fierce fighting and bombings resumed. In an exclusive video by reporter Dmitry Maslak, who entered the steel plant from the northwest side, it shows continued explosions at the site. Judging from the map of the Azovstal steel plant, Maslak said the shelling mainly targeted several workshops and the plant, with airstrikes focusing on areas near the two chimneys. And to a hospital in the small Ukrainian town of Bakhmut, it was never intended to receive queues of ambulances bringing the wounded and traumatized from the front line of Europe's biggest battlefield. Nor did the volunteer paramedics expect four months ago to be shuttling back and forth to the front line of a brutal tank battle with an earshot of rockets and shelling. I haven't seen so much human tragedy before, and these are like absolutely unnecessary uh, uh, sufferings. I understand there's a war and everybody says, well, you know, there will be casualties, but okay, which is appalling in a way, uh, but uh, when like, you know, Russian sniper just kills a mother of the family who are going to cross the bridge, like to, to European, well, there is, there's no justification to that. The hospital's main job now is to stabilize the injured from the battle zone around the towns of Popasna and the Luhansk region so they can be moved on to bigger hospitals in western Ukraine, farther from the main battle. The Ukraine state gas grid operator Getsu has said that it will stop the transit of Russian gas via the Sokhranovka route starting Wednesday due to force majeure affecting the delivery of a third of the fuel from Russia to Europe through Ukraine. Getsu said in a statement that it's not able to operate the compressor station at Novopskov, which is located in northern Luhansk, as Ukraine has lost control of the area. Finland's Prime Minister Sanna Marin has said that if her nation takes the historic step to apply to join the NATO alliance, it will be for the security of its own citizens and that the move would strengthen the whole global community. That's right. Marine, who is a, on a three-day visit to Tokyo, also mentioned Russia's actions in Ukraine openly violating international law and the Charter of the United Nations. She spoke just the day after meeting the Japanese Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, and also a day before uh, the Finnish president, Sauli um, Nis Nisto, is expected to say whether his country, which shares a long border with Russia, will apply to join the NATO alliance. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has pushed Finland and neighboring Sweden to the verge of applying for NATO membership, abandoning a belief held for decades that peace was best kept by not publicly choosing sides, but countries are close NATO partners, having taken part in the Allied exercises for years. With Prime Minister Kishida, we discussed Russia's horrible aggression against Ukraine and its consequences. Russia violates openly international law and the Charter of the United Nations. The atrocities against civilians continues. This cannot be accepted from any nation and even less from a permanent member of the Security Council.
told Prime Minister Kishida about our plans to possibly apply for NATO membership. If Finland makes this historical step, it is for the security of our own citizens. Joining NATO would strengthen the whole international community that stands for our common values. With Prime Minister Kishida, we discussed the general disappointment towards the United Nations Security Council. The power of veto has been abused. We must reform the Council to become transparent, more effect effective and more representative. <laughs> We'll have more on the situation in Ukraine coming up after the break. Plus, the UK Prime Minister is saying Northern Ireland's protocol needs to be sorted out. And the Belfast Peace Agreement is the most important treaty to protect. Stay with us. Welcome back. The UK has signed an agreement with Sweden and Finland to support both nations should they come under attack, most probably by Russia. Earlier today, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said he had agreed a new deal with his Swedish counterpart. It was described by Britain as a step change in defence and security cooperation. The deal was signed during his visit to Sweden. And he'll be signing the same deal with Finland in a few minutes. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has forced a rethink of how Sweden and neighbour Finland safeguard national security. Both are expected to join NATO, but worry they would be vulnerable while their application are being processed, which could take up to a year. Sweden has also received assurances from Germany and the United States. Meanwhile, the British Prime Minister says the Northern Ireland Protocol needs to be sorted out and that the Belfast Peace Agreement is the most important treaty to protect. His comments came as Britain today rejected the EU proposal to resolve a standoff over post-Brexit trade rustles for Northern Ireland, saying it would not shy away from taking direct action in the latest escalation between the two sides. Striking a deal that preserved peace in Northern Ireland and protected the EU single market without imposing a hardland uh, border border between the British province and EU member state Ireland or a border within the United Kingdom has was always the biggest challenge for London as it embarked on its exit from the bloc. It agreed a protocol which instead created a customs border in the sea between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK but now says the required bureaucracy is intolerable. And on the uh, on the on the the protocol. I, you, you've heard me. You've all heard me say this many times. The, the most important uh, agreement is the 25-year-old uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Uh, that uh, is crucial for the stability of uh, of, of our country, uh, of the UK and Northern Ireland. And uh, it's got a. It's got. That means that uh, things have got to command across community support. Plainly, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, fails to, to do that. We need to sort it out. To local politics in the United States now, where former President Donald Trump's pick for Nebraska's Republican primary election for governor, Charles Hepster, lost to his rival, Jim Pillen, on Tuesday night. The Nebraska contest had been nominated, dominated bigger part in recent weeks by ac accusations that Hepster, an agriculture executive, had sexually harassed several women, which he's denied. Edison Research projected that Pillen, a hog farmer and university board member, would defeat Hepster and win the nomination. Pillen was endorsed by the current governor, Pete Ricketts. And while in West uh, Virginia, the voters opted for Representative Alex Mooney, a candidate who's been backed by Trump's false claims, who's backed Trump's false claims about fraud in the 2020 presidential election. Uh, those elections which held yesterday are part of a series of nominating contests which will set the stage for the November 8th elections in which Republicans are favored to win control of at least 
one chamber of Congress, which would give them the power to bring Democratic President Joe Biden's legislative agenda to a halt. But I just want to encourage you, we have to try to unite the Republican Party in Nebraska. It's going to take some, it's going to take some work, and we're going to have to band together, those of us who are godly conservatives. But I would just share with you that we have to do that. It's necessary. I'm going to go to the event tomorrow and obviously have the chance to shake Kim Pillen's hand and congratulate him. I want him to know that. I called him tonight. We had a chat on the phone. Um, we just love each and every one of you. And you know what? The future is bright. We're going to whip Congress and whip Senate. In 2022, in November, I guarantee you we are. We're going to turn around the direction we're going as a national basis today, where Biden has taken us, where the Democrats have taken us, the liberals have taken us. We have to do that. We have to continue to fight against drugs coming across the Nebraska border. We have to fight against illegals coming into the state of Nebraska. We can't let up on any of those individuals. Donald Trump's influence will be put to the test in the high-profile Senate contest later this month, I believe in Pennsylvania, North Carolina and Georgia. While well, staying in the United States, Americans' pockets are being impacted by increased inflation in the country. But President Joe Biden Tuesday night provided Americans with a plan to address this economic challenge. Our Washington correspondent Maria Bird reports. Uh, Maria's report in a minute, but Maria joins us now for more um, our Washington correspondents. Maria, is the president's plan on a, well, lost uh, the connection with Maria. I will try to reconnect with her and then get back to that story. In the meantime, making a brief stop back in Europe, uh, the European Union has outlined plans to better protect children against online sexual abuse, obliging internet service providers to detect, report and remove any such material regardless of where they are based. The initiative was presented by EU Commissioner for Home Affairs, Ilvia Johansson and EU Demo Democracy and Demography Commissioner Dubrivka Suka. Suka says most children in the EU use their smartphones daily and almost twice as much compared to 10 years ago and from a much younger age. And at least 60% of child sexual abuse material worldwide is hosted on EU this servers. Is about a the vision for today's child, right, child rights package is for children to be protected, empowered and respected online with no one left behind. Therefore, today we have adopted a new Better Internet for Kids strategy and a regulation to fight online child sexual abuse. This proposal is about a groundbreaking European legislation that will help you to prosecute more uh, criminals and to the perpetrators we are coming for you It's been another day of lockdown restrictions in the Chinese capital, Beijing, with public transport disrupted, malls emptied out and fresh rounds of mass testing ready for citizens and residents, some of whom are beginning to feel like their lives are being controlled. The measures to contain COVID-19 infections have caused significant economic damage in China and beyond. While residents in Beijing are relatively calm, the ruthlessly enforced isolation in Shanghai has taken a huge psychological toll on many fueling rare outpourings of anger at the authorities. Official data shows Beijing reported 24 new locally transmitted uh, symptomatic coronavirus cases for May 10, down from 61 a day earlier. 
Well, Chinese authorities are warning, have warned the Director General of the World Health Organization, Tedros Ghebreyesus, to avoid making what they call irresponsible remarks after he said China's zero COVID policy was not sustainable. During a regular news conference in Beijing, Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian defended China's measures on fighting the pandemic and said China hoped the WHO Director General would view China's COVID policies objectively. On Tuesday, Mr. Ghebreyesus said China's zero tolerance COVID-19 policy was not sustainable given what is now known of the virus and rare public comments by the UN agency on government's handling of the pandemic. His comments come after China's leaders repeated their resolve to battle the virus with tough measures and threatened action against critics at home even as strict and prolonged lockdowns exact a heavy toll on the world's second largest economy. Paul Hittenberg also is an official with Shanghai's Disease Control Center, uh, this time at criticism of the city's harsh COVID quarantine measures, saying the detention of large numbers of people declared to be close contact with positive cases was illegal. Deputy Director of Shanghai Municipal Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Sun Shedong, says the policies we are implementing right now are in accordance with the relevant laws and regulations. Sun's added adds a clause in China's infectious disease law stipulated individuals were obliged to comply with measures adopted by the CDC and other health care agencies to prevent the spread of disease. In a battle to stifle China's largest COVID-19 outbreak, Shanghai has forced neighbors of positive cases to move into central quarantine facilities even if they have tested negative. Social media has also been flooded with accounts of authorities demanding keys to homes being handed over for disinfection spurring outrage, raising questions of legality among residents and also experts. It is good news, however, in New Zealand, as Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says, the country will fully reopen its international borders from 11.59 p.m. on July 31st, with cruise ships also welcome back to local ports on the same day. The end July opening of the border is two months earlier than the government's previous time frame and will mean visitors who need visas will now be able to come to New Zealand. Ms. Ardern said in a speech to a business New Zealand lunch in Auckland that opening the border would help to relieve urgent skills shortage, open up tourism and put immigration settings on a more secure footing. New Zealand had some of the toughest curbs in the world during the pandemic and only recently started to ease the increasingly unpopular measures hoping to boost tourism and ease labour shortages. Now the Omicron variant is widespread domestically. Today I can announce a package to speed up our economic recovery while setting us up to address long-term challenges. First, today, I can announce that New Zealand fully reopens to the world by July 31, completing our reconnecting work two months ahead of schedule. Now that we have dates, I understand that the next question naturally is whether all of our border settings, including pre-departure testing, will remain in place. As we begin the consultation on our variant plan, it's clear that monitoring at the border will continue to be important, but we will be able to change up the role that pre-departure testing has played. Today represents a significant milestone in our recovery plan. This package is designed to address the urgent skill shortages created by COVID, while also putting our immigration settings on a better and more sustainable footing. I'll stay with COVID-19. On a sunny afternoon, Elim Wenda happily snapped pictures of his sister, Rebecca Mithinji, by the Eiffel Tower, two of many tourists enjoying a long overdue break in Paris after freezing holiday plans due to the pandemic. Right, that Paris trip for the siblings was a graduation gift for Mitinji, and who initially planned it for 2020. Uh, two years later, they finally made it with Mitinji traveling from Britain and Mwenda all the way from Kenya. The Paris tourist office is forecasting foreign visitors will increase more than fivefold in May, July compared to the same period last year. 
So well, thanks to tourists from Spain, Germany, Britain and Italy. Well, that will, however, still be a third less than pre-pandemic levels, partly because U.S. and Asian tourists are not expected to be back in large numbers yet. All right, let's go over to the United States now. Uh, we had earlier told you that Maria has reported about the inflation that appears to be skyrocketing and, of course, the Ukraine invasion and several other things are impacting the numbers. Let's take a look. Americans are concerned that the U.S. economy will continue to fall. U.S. President Joe Biden announced on Tuesday that he has a plan to reduce inflation, which will stabilize the economy. I know the families all across America are hurting because of inflation. I want, uh, I want every American to know that I'm taking inflation uh, very seriously and it's my top for domestic priority. My plan attacks inflation and grows the economy by lowering costs for working families, giving workers well-deserved raises, reducing the deficit by historic levels, and making big corporations and very wealthiest Americans pay their fair share. The other path is the ultra mega plan put forward by congressional republicans to raise taxes on working families lower the income of american workers threaten sacred programs americans count on like social security medicare and medicaid and give break after break to big corporations and billionaires. The president's speech was in direct response to the current battle Americans are facing with rising gas and oil prices in the midst of supporting the war in Ukraine. The support of Ukraine is moving beyond just a political statement, but the U.S. First Lady has now made an unannounced visit to the country, having met with Ukrainian refugees. That is important to show the Ukrainian people this war has to stop. And this war has been brutal. It's difficult to explain. I uh, no, I don't know. Uh, I only said that this war. I cannot explain. I cannot explain because I don't know myself. While President Joe Biden continues to receive bipartisan support for aid packages to Ukraine, the White House economic recovery plan is not supported by many Republicans, as Republican Senator Rick Scott is calling for President Biden's resignation. The political battle toward the midterm elections will be heavily dependent upon the economic recovery in the U.S. From Washington, Maria Byrd, Channel Television News. And Maria joins us when we return. Still ahead on the program. Internally displaced persons in Nigeria learn how to identify and avoid explosive devices. You stay with us. Welcome back to the world today. A look at the U.S. economy today as President Joe Biden announced Tuesday night a plans to tackle the country's economic challenge. Our Washington correspondent Maria Bird monitored the speech. She joins us now. Maria, great to see you. Is the president's plan a one-size-fits-all for the American people? When you really look at the plan, you see where it's pretty much focused in on several different groups in the U.S. It's those who are underemployed, those who are still dependent heavily on social services in the U.S., those who are in the middle of the road um, who are still looking for employment or those who have left their employment because they felt they were underpaid or needed to deal with family circumstances. And then it also deals with those wealthier in the U.S. and how uh, many of the corporate taxes are going to potentially be re-implemented uh, to ensure there's a equity across the board as, as it relates to how taxes are paid. So it really looks at the various groups across the United States and it heavily deals with the supply chain challenges that are greatly impacting the inflation. So it is really interesting. The country is going through high inflation, but we've seen, you know, some of the, the polls showing this administration has provided more jobs for the American people than previous administrations. When it comes to the dollars and cents of it, Maria, how badly is the American economy doing? You're exactly correct. There are more jobs available. The question is, are there individuals that are willing to go out and work the jobs? Many people have gone home as a result of COVID-19, gone home to take care of family, or just had different outlooks on how they want to live their life, their quality of life. Um, and so that has made more jobs available. And obviously, as a result of COVID, uh, the world has changed, and the work environment and the needs have changed. And obviously, the U.S. is obviously dealing with um, infrastructure challenges. And so there's a great deal 
scale of jobs in that infrastructure field that are needed to be filled, but there's also a skill set, skill set shortage as well. Um, and so what we're going to begin to see is we're going to really begin to see uh, the dollar and cents components potentially meet up with the needs that exist. But if you're looking at someone who, you know, restaurants are looking for waitresses, well, the, the, the salary of a waitress just does not meet um, what is needed and required to be able to sustain the cost of living in the U.S. And most importantly, being able to even just put food on the table as grocery store prices um, have skyrocketed 30 to 40 percent just in the last 30 to 45 days. So, Maria, some would say how much more jobs really were created. Some would say 448,000 isn't a lot compared to the number of people uh, the size of the country. Um, but, I mean, if inflation is still high and, and some of that being blamed on the COVID pandemic, um, what is the practical solution to improving the numbers? Well, President Biden, as we've discussed, has come out with a very a plan um, that he believes a practical solution. Uh, the first effort is really going to be able to get some of the skill sets meeting with the needs um, and being able to ensure, because if you look at the, the inflation has increased, but the salaries and the uh, what people are being paid on the hourly wages have not been increased over the past few years. And so when you have uh, this uh, unbalance in that area, you're really going to see um, not being able to meet the basic needs. But again, from a very practical perspective, if they're able to balance out the salaries um, and the income individuals are making in comparison to inflation, that will obviously adjust it as well. And if they can begin to balance out the supply chain challenges and be able to produce more at a, at a much lower rate. President Biden also says he's considering eliminating Trump-era tariffs on China um, as a way to, to lower prices for goods in the U.S., though he has not made any decision uh, on it yet. I know you've spoken to some economists about this. Where do most of them stand? Most economists foresee this is going to definitely have to occur. Um, we had, you know, obviously a major trade relationships prior to the Trump administration with China. Um, as we know, there still exist some challenges politically between the U.S. and China, um, despite the change of administration. But I believe that at this point now, uh, President Biden and what many economists are seeing, he has no choice but to try to mend ways and to try to increase um, those relationships, those tariffs, reducing those, if not eliminating those as a whole, and really being able to bolster um, the relationship, the economic relationship between the U.S. and China. Maria Bird in Washington, thanks again. Politics now in Australia this time. Incumbent rightist Prime Minister Scott Morrison and main opposition leader Anthony Albanese of the leftist Labour Party both took in part in the third and final leaders' debate today, trading barbs on who could run the country better. Morrison and Albanese fielded questions from journalist Mark Riley, with the viewers in marginal seats asked to vote on who they want to be leader after seeing the debate. According to the viewer verdicts poll, Albanese had a comfortable win with 50% of the viewership, while Morrison had a 34% of the vote and 16% remained undecided. It was the general election will be held on May 21st. Good evening and welcome to the final showdown. There are just 10 days to go before Australia chooses its next leaders for the Prime Ministership face to face. A final time you'll see them in the same room together until Australia votes and decides which one will lead us into the future. Our childcare policy cost is $5.4 billion over the forward estimates, which is less than the $5.5 billion, is the less than the $5.5 billion that you spent on submarines that just ended up with a torn up contract. The okay. waste that you have done. You don't support the submarine this is, contract. This is the most, you don't either, you tore it up with the no, French. No, the one, I, the, the, the one we're doing with the Americans the one with, or the British. We do support Corpus. that and you know that. Well, all right, doesn't Ms. sound Ms. like Ms. Morrison, it. Ms. Morrison, Ms. It's the Ms. French Albanese contract you point. tore up. Yes, it cost and we were right to do that. It cost $5.5 billion and produced nothing. This is the most wasteful government in Australia's history. Waste and rorts is something that has characterised this government because it treats taxpayers' money we like will, it's Liberal Party We will Party get on money. that, but we've got to move on. Uh, character. And this is a Labor leader who comes from the far left of the party and has been very loose 
He's a loose unit when it comes to the economy. He makes things up as he goes along. The policies he comes up with, he doesn't think through. He's got a housing policy where if you get a wage rise, you've got to sell your house. Um, he's got a, a health true. policy that he hasn't been able to cost. He says it's costed, but it's uncosted. I have an experienced team. We, we are ready for government. And, and all we see from this government that is now seeking a fourth term in office. They don't have an agenda for today, let alone an agenda for the next term. All they have is abuse and scare campaigns and fear campaigns, no policies for the future. Well, we can do better than that. All right, Mr. Albert, you... We saw it with the bushfires, uh, where he rejected the idea that there was any connection with climate change of, of these events, uh, where he didn't turn up, and when he did turn up, uh, he turned up with an ad uh, with a with a donate to Liberal Party button in the corner during that bushfire crisis. We saw similarly with the floods, a failure to act early enough and then partisan decisions based upon where support would go. We saw it importantly with the failure to order vaccines early enough. Just like he said it wasn't, uh, he didn't hold a hose in the bushfires, in the, in the pandemic he said that it wasn't a race to get vaccines. It was. It was. And so, Prime Minister, I'll give you a minute to rebut those allegations. Well, for the past three years, Mr Albanese's been an armchair critic. He's like that, that person on Monday morning who always says what should have happened on the weekend. And you know what? You never let that person run the team. He's always wise in hindsight. He's always got criticisms to make. And that's been his job for the last three years. So why is it we're 10 days out and we still don't know what his economic plan is? We still don't know how he would run the economy. He still didn't know three weeks ago what the unemployment rate was, let alone what the cash rate was. And so what we're dealing with here is a, a leader of the Labor Party who's great on criticism, he's great at pointing at problems, but he doesn't have solutions for them, and even more importantly, he doesn't know how to pay for them. I we'll be seeing more of that ahead of May 21. Mm -hmm. A wounded Al Jazeera reporter whose colleague was shot dead during an Israeli raid in the occupied West Bank today claimed Israeli forces shot us for no reason. His words. Ali Al Samoudi, a Palestinian journalist, was wounded alongside Shireen Abu Akleh, uh, the colleague who was killed. Akleh, 51 year old Palestinian American, was wearing a press vest. Uh, clearly marked her as a journalist while reporting in the city of Jenin. She was covering the latest and intensified military incursion in the West Bank launched amid deadly Arab street attacks in Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has said that according to information uh, Israel has gathered so far, it appears likely that armed Palestinians who are firing indiscriminately at the time were responsible for the unfortunate death of the journalist. The Palestinian Health Ministry said she had been hit in the head by gunfire. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said that Al Jazeera described her death as blatant cold-blooded murder by Israeli forces. In a statement, the military said its troops had shot back after coming under massive fire in Janine. Well, just to mention the colleagues of uh, the reporter Shireen Alclair uh, mourned her death carrying her body in the streets of Janine today. At Pope Francis, they arrived in St. Peter's Square, sitting in an open Pope mobile, which drove him to the rear of the platform facing the crowd. We'll see that in a moment. The 85-year-old uh, Pope walked slowly while holding the arm of an aide limping as he approached his seat about 11 yards away. Just last Thursday, as an audience for a group of nuns, the Pope used a wheelchair chair in public for the first time since the new flare-up of pain in the knee had limited his ability to walk. Mm -hmm. While speaking to the at the end of a general audience in St. Peter's Square, Pope Francis urged authorities in Sri Lanka, which has been shaken by unrest over the country's worst economic crisis, to listen to the hopes of the people and respect human rights and civil liberties. Protesters have targeted the family of Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaska, blaming them for a meltdown in the Indian Ocean nation that has brought massive shortage of key items of food, fuel and medicine. 
A passenger on board a United Airlines flight captured the moment when the plane made an emergency landing in the Peruvian capital, Lima. UA-855 was traveling to Houston, Texas from Lima when it developed technical problems. It had taken off from Lima's Jorge Chavez airport and had to return after the incident. The passenger filmed sparks flying from the tires as the plane made the emergency landing. Passengers safely disembarked from the plane. In a statement, United Airlines said its maintenance team will investigate what caused the technical problem. Local media reports that the damage was located in one of the engines. It's pretty scary. And two hundred displaced persons in Borno State here in Nigeria are learning how to identify and avoid explosive devices. Using images and simulations, Nigerians placed displaced by Delhi Islamist insurgency are receiving life-saving lessons about how to identify those devices, right? A training is organized by Global Humanitarian and Advocacy Organization, Minds Advocacy Group. Global Humanitarian and Advocacy Organization, Minds Advisory Group, MAG, is coordinating the teachings around the northeast of Nigeria, helping people from war-ravaged communities live, play and work as safely as possible. Back in 2014, when Jedai Jantiku was still a student at the University of Maduguri, he unknowingly picked up a bomb after soldiers repelled a Boko Haram attack with plans to show it to the security. But an older man asked him to drop it gently and instead go and call the security to manage the situation. That near-death experience inspired him to join MAG to teach others. Jantiku is now a community liaison officer with MAG. Now, most of the beneficiaries in the camps in Borno or all displaced people in Borno entirely, they are farmers. Some are firewood vendors, some are hunters. And all these people used to go to the bush and get their livelihood activities. And these bush are placed at the battlefield during this insurgency for the past eight years. So they used to get in contact with this ARW in the community. At this camp in Bornu, northeast Nigeria, workers are teaching the people how to identify and avoid coming in contact with explosive devices. Using pictures, banners and other objects for simulation, they are taught to identify landmines, bombs and several other types of explosives and reach out to authorities for safe removal. For Umar Sani, Gubio camp has been his home for eight years since he fled his village during a Boko Haram raid. He's been living here with his two wives and 17 children. He says though it is not safe for him to go back to the village, learning how to live a risk-free life will be a plus if they are finally evacuated. If we are to go back to our villages now, then I sincerely see it as a forced eviction. The reason is that we left our villages because of conflict and the problems are still there. MAG's contribution in this camp is that they gather us district by district and enlighten us on what to do or avoid when we eventually go back to our villages. The displaced persons in these communities who are predominantly farmers and firewood sellers who wade through forests and bush paths are taught not to touch these explosives when they sight them, but to reach out to authorities for action. Some of them don't used to know what these items are. They used to pick them as scrap metal or they used to pick them so that they can use it in doing pot or other activities. So before they know, it will end up taking their life. But with our activity commencing in Borno, some of them get to know that some of the items are dangerous items and they are appreciating our activity for saving their lives. Borno, which shares a border with Niger, Cameroon and Chad, has for more than a decade been the foremost outpost of insurgency. <laughs> Well, hopefully they will be able to identify those items and avoid them on site. Thanks for watching. I'm Amirakshi Ubani. And I'm Melissa Morgan. Have a good evening.